Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. Thank you so much. And utilizing your uh, very talented gift and the gift of music there and helping us begin to get our hearts softened as we uh, descend into worship. We have a change of order of service today. Uh, we're going to go totally off the cuff. So I don't know how the Spirit's going to uh, lead all the time, but we have um, a baptism um, scheduled with uh, uh, Crystal and her daughter, 10-year-old daughter Hannah, but uh, something's happened to where they're running 15 minutes behind. Okay, all right. So give them a hand for coming, yeah. Hey, Crystal. Thank you all for coming. And so uh, we're excited about that. You know, we introduced, uh, you know, our short little uh, mission statement last week before we went into prayer, and that's that crossroads exist to awaken people spiritually. Let's say it together. Crossroads exist to awaken people spiritually. I can't think of a, a better uh, equal sign than to go to a baptism um, after saying that, to awaken people spiritually. And so we're excited because when people get baptized, that's evidence that the Spirit of God has moved in their life and has drawn them to God into a saving knowledge of our Savior. And so um, we have a lot of things going on we need to pray over. So before we go into uh, the baptism portion of our service, we just want to go into some corporate prayer, I believe, we need to do because we have a lot of people ailing at the last minute. Last night we had three of our members go to the ER. Alan Carroll, many of you know as texts have been circulating, um, had a heart attack uh, last night and while he was um, washing uh, his cooker and fortunately uh, Peggy was there and she immediately administered CPR and they called the ambulance and um, he actually coded and people were praying all over and miraculously they revived him um, starting with Peggy, you know, being there. And so he was given 90% chance to die, and now it's been upgraded to 50-50. Uh, so he's in uh, a medical coma at Carolina East, and so we need to continue to pray for him. Because uh, they said the next 24 hours is critical, is critical. And Manny said he took a little turn for the worst this morning. So we need to keep praying. We need to keep praying as a church. Amen. And I've, I've got 10 churches at least across this country praying over him and Peggy. I called um, three pastors I know in Vermont from a Vermont trip. I've got churches in South Carolina, the Summit Church in Raleigh. I've got churches in Tacoma, Washington, uh, in South Carolina, uh, and beyond. I, I, so let's join a massive amount of praying over Peggy, because Peggy, I think all that stress caused her to have her own heart attack uh, later. So she went to the ER. And then John Marsh. John, um, are, you, are you here? I think John's here. Uh, he's somewhere here today, but he was in the ER last night, too, for heart issues. So we're taking some hits, and when we get hit, we need a counter assault with uh, the weapon of prayer. So I want you to pray. I want you to pray with me. Uh, our church needs prayer. Um, as uh, pray for Terry Burgess as well. He's, COVID's really getting him down, getting such a bad, uh, getting uh, severe symptoms there. So he's asking for prayer. And so we have many, and Tammy Grandstaff, our audio sound guy's uh, wife, uh, she was unable to lead the praise team this morning. So we're, we need her to be lifted up in prayer too. All right, but you know what? Despite all that, I'm at perfect peace for what God's doing and trying to do. And that we have a great, great Savior uh, that is with us during this time. So if you pray with me, and uh, if you feel led to come to the altar to pray, you can. You can come up here forward to pray with me. You can pray at your seat. But however the Lord leads you to pray, we're going to make this a time of just coming together and praying corporately over what God is trying to do here at our church. I've always prayed. Um, that God would bring um, revival um, through all of this in some way. We can be revived no matter what's happening. Uh, like Alan's heart was revived, we can be revived spiritually. Let's pray now. I'll lead us. Lord, we just come before you acknowledging that you are uh, the God of the universe. We declare your, um, your authority and your reality your presence on the throne this hour. Father, we're not immune to sickness and people uh, being afflicted with all kinds of ailments and, and churches being hit um, in different countries by being persecuted by the enemy, by the sword, by bombs. 
Now, the enemy is attacking all over the world. So the, the Word of God says that we don't have to be surprised as if something's happening that's foreign or, um, or to scare us, Father. No, that, Father, as long as we live in this world, uh, we're going to have these seasons of battles. But as Bobby Lewis told me this morning, Buford always told her that we'll get through this. We'll get through this just as the Lord's gotten us through other things. He'll get us through this as well. That you promised to never leave us nor forsake us. In fact, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest apostles and warriors of the New Testament, he encountered a lot of resistance and counterattacks to him getting the gospel out. But he was never um, derailed or just discouraged to a point where he, he tapped out. He kept his hand on the plow. And I know that's what's kept me, Father, uh, going. And, and I just praise you. We just praise you and thank you for the, the peace that surpasses all understanding that you afford us, that we can experience in these times, Father, of crisis. So we lift up to you, Alan and Peggy, right now at this hour. We pray for Alan see him revive fully we can see him walking and talking again and for Peggy who was calm this morning the verse I gave her father I reiterate again father that when we have when we hear bad news that we don't have to be fearful because our heart can be steadfast trusting in the Lord always with every step and with every beat of our heart Help us stand stride with you as a church. That, that in fact, you have a way of making these things make us even stronger. And so we're praying for strength, God. We thank you this morning, Father, for the celebration we're about to have in this beautiful baptism service of two wonderful, precious people you've drawn to yourself. We continue to pray, Father, for the carols and for John Marsh, the healing of his heart find out what's going on there with him. For Terry Burgess, we lift him up to you, and, and Tammy Grandstaff, Father. We pray for miraculous healing for her. We love her and care for her. We love for all of our members. Father, we're just praying. We're just pouring out prayer as many churches are praying for us. Lord, hear, hear our prayers. As Jeremiah 17, 14 says, Lord, heal us, Lord we shall be healed. Save us, Lord, and we shall be saved. Trusting in you, Father. Give us the light of day today. Increase your presence. You have a way, Father, of uh, increasing your presence in these, these moments. And may we see an outpouring of your spirit. The Bible has been going around the country and parts of the world. We pray that maybe perhaps this could be the beginning of starting one here. We pray this all in Jesus' name as we build our house on you foundation of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you all sing together a song we just kind of put together at the last minute here? We're a church that wants to build our life on the foundation of Christ and His salvation. And so we're going to sing this song together if you'd join with me.
you know you have a God who runs after you, you got a God running after you today. Even though Satan may throw barriers and hurdles after you, I'm a former hurdler, so I know it's like to jump, have to jump over hurdles. So he's going to throw everything he can at you, but despite the hurdles he throws at you, we can jump over them, we can hurl over them, and finish the cross, the finish line. Amen? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to finish the, the, uh, the finish line today together. So we've got our candidates going back to get uh, ready for the baptism. They did make it. We praise God for that, that they are here. And so we give God the praise and victory for that. And, uh, you know, we can run after God because he ran after us. And so we're going to keep running after God, right? Run with me. Let's run together this race that God has uh, set before us. All right, so I'm going to ask the person that was scheduled to do the welcome announcements, Butch. And then we got Lydia Allen, who's going to give an Annie Armstrong promo. And then hopefully we can descend into the waters. All right. I hope you all forgive me a little bit while I lean up against this rail over here. I'm, I'm, I'm minus a leg, or at least a knee anyway. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, Crossroads Baptist this morning. It is good to see all of you here. We've got a fairly good crowd here this morning, and it's always good to see smiling faces here in God's house. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of announcements here. The Wednesday night meal this week is going to be pizza. And it starts at 6.30, so if you want some pizza, huh? At 6, I'm sorry, thanks, thanks for the correction. Starts at 6. Come out and enjoy some pizza with, uh, with your church family. After the uh, Wednesday night meal, there will be a, a Bible study prayer and inter intercessory prayer to study right after the meal. So please come out and join, join us for that. And on Friday, at 10 o'clock, is the ladies' Bible study with Miss Margaret Dowhouse, very good, strong teacher. Uh, the name of the the, uh, the study that they're doing is Christ Above All, and she is a very, very pleasant person to be with, and she is a very, very good teacher. So uh, I would definitely encourage you, if you're a lady, please come out and sign up for that and uh, and be a part of it. And uh, this coming Saturday, there's going to be an intentional living seminar with Leinster Strayhorn from 10 to 12.30, he will be talking about uh, depression, anxiety, and other wanted feelings that we have going in our hearts and our minds every single day. The devil is trying to attack us, and he's going to show us how to overcome that and just be stronger in God's Word. And again, that will be Saturday from 10 to 12.30. And there's a sign-up sheet in the very front, in the vestibule. And uh, this coming Saturday, was going to be from 9, I think it's to 1.30, is going to be a summit meeting. And if you don't know what the summit meeting is all about, you probably haven't been to the first one. But the summit meeting is about uh, it went right out, right out of my head. <laughs> discipleship, yes, discipleship training, uh, teaching us how to uh, witness to others and to, uh, to be good listeners and to be good talkers to people who are around us who uh, may not know Jesus. So the, uh, this, the summit is about the, the discipleship and to uh, learn how to witness for him better than what we are doing now. So come out for that. If you, if you haven't been, uh, there have been three others here in the past, and this will be the, the fourth one. And again, it will start at 9 to one thirty. And I believe there will be a little uh, a snack for, for breakfast and just a little bit of a, a real short lunch uh, while you're here. This coming Saturday. Okay. I don't have a bulletin. What, what day is it on? Okay. Well, my pardon. Okay, the intentional living seminar will be March 11th. Saturday, Saturday, March 11th, and the, 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 the discipleship summit will be, re, read the bulletin, rem, and remember, it's not the Bible, 
but we have a lot of good things going on here at church. Um, if you're uh, if you're not plugged in, read it, and, and you'll find a place to uh, to fit in, and uh, be a part of a wonderful group of people here at church. If there's if there's anybody else wonderful than, than what we have right here, I don't know, because these folks here are just just as nice and, and graceful and very uh, pleasant to one another, and we just know how to love on everybody. And speaking on that, we have a birthday in the house, Miss Ann Mills. Yes. So we're going to sing happy birthday to you right now. Along with having a lot of infirmities in his body, one of them that sticks out the most is a CRS. Can't remember stuff. <laughs> let's uh, let's have a quick prayer, real quick, before I get out of here, and uh, see if God will bless this house. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. You know you love us. Heavenly Father, you show us your love, your mercy, and grace every single day. We wake up and take a breath, and we know you're with us. We see the sun shining, and we know you're with us. Heavenly Father, things don't have to be right in this world to know that you're with us. Because even though there are bad things going on all around us, people with heart issues, different infirmities in their body, they strike them down and make them weak and uh, make them uh, not well. Heavenly Father, you being the great physician that you are, Heavenly Father, you have got the power to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to heal any infirmity, any illness in these bodies. So, Heavenly Father, we call upon you right now with uh, Alan Carroll and his wife Peggy and mine and my friend John Marsh. Uh, Heavenly Father, there are so many people here in our church who, uh, who have heart issues. So, Heavenly Father, we just uh, call on you to uh, give us your assurance of your presence with us and continue to help us and uh, keep these bodies going that we may continue to love you and praise you and give you glory in all that we do. And Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, it, it, can you all hear me? Okay. Annie Armstrong. Now, you know that Anessa is your mission leader, but she's not here. So she asked me to do the Annie Armstrong intro for this this, this week. This is the uh, week of prayer. And so, y'all, I think there's some prayer guides outside. She said they would probably be there, so check and see. But anyway, uh, the, un the theme for this year is united, called to be one. And the scripture is Philippians 2, 1 and 2. And it says, if then there's any encouragement in Christ, if any in co uh, consolation in love, if any fellowship in the spirit, if any affection in mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That, so that's our scripture verse that we will be thinking about this week. Okay, the goal for Annie Armstrong, hold your breath, is $70 million. What? Well, that's, not a, that's not such a high goal for the United States. <laughs> The goal for Crossroads is 2,000. So we went from 70 million to 2,000, so y'all know you can do the 2,000, okay? We can do that. I'm gonna give you a couple examples of where this money goes. Ridgewood, New York. Emmanuel Grozaya was born in communist Russia, to, uh, communist Romania to a family of smugglers, Bible smugglers. As a teenager, he felt the call to be a minister. He pastored for almost 10 years in Romania before moving, God moved him and his family to a Romanian church in New York that was on the verge of closing. Half the community in that speaks other than English. 
so he wa his idea was to, or God's idea was to, a vision to meet the needs of his community. Replant, transition this church from a struggling Romanian church into a house of worship for all nations. So right now they are leading in, uh, let's see, Alba uh, leading with the Albanian, Nepali, Polish, Latino, Egyptian, Italian, Turkish, Armenian, and Romanian neighbors. They meet separately for Sunday school and then come together, <coughs> come together for worship. This is where your money goes. There's another one. I'm going to read one more, and that's going to be it because we've got so much to do today. But um, there's a woman in Calif uh, Louisiana. She is a, a director of a home that gets people off the street. A lot of them are trafficked people, and you know what that means, human trafficking. She tries to get them off the street and tries to get them the help they need to get back into the life that they deserve, the life that they need, the life that we want for, for us. And she says, I have often said I found a home with the homeless. My call from the beginning was to minister to hurting people. There's no shortage of hurting people in the French Quarter of New Orleans. People living on the streets are typically dealing with trauma and are vulnerable to being trafficked. To help people, the way to help people in desperate need is to see each one as an individual with a unique story, which we should do anyway. Now, I don't know if y'all have been to New Orleans, but I have. My brother lives there. He took me to, uh, me and my husband, to the French Quarter. Walking down Bourbon Street, I had my brother here and my husband here, and I hung on tight because I could feel the evil. It was, you, you could literally, physically feel the evil. So, yes, we need to pray for this lady, too. Her name's Kay Bennett, and so we need to pray for all missionaries. We pray for missionaries that are going out of the country, but remember, we've got a lot of missionaries in country, too and we need to be praying for them. So we will do that right now. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you will touch the missionaries that are within this country, uh, not only this country, but North America as a whole. Father, they've got a job to do that is so hard to do because it's hard to reach the people that you know. But Father, I ask you to give them special discernment, give them special wisdom, and give them special protection. Lead them where you would have them to go. Have them speak what you would have them speak. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This is a special occasion we have here today, Crystal. I met Crystal at Subway. She's the manager at Subway at James City. So if you ever uh, have a chance uh, to go over there during the week, um, they would love for you to come over there. And uh, they have a, a tip jar, right? No, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to come over there and just blitz that tip jar with all those workers that are working hard, uh, you know, in this area? But I met Crystal at Subway and connected uh, really quick. And I don't know how long we've known each other, maybe three months, but... Yeah. She's a believer in Christ, and she says she's never experienced believer's baptism, and she wants to experience that today. Her daughter, uh, Hannah, who's 10, says, I want Mama to go first because I'm really nervous and scared. Oh, eight? She's eight? Oh, okay. Wow. I don't know where I got 10 from. All right. But, yeah. So, yeah. Crystal, come on over. Yeah. So, Crystal, at some point in your life, you've accepted Christ as your Savior. You believe that he died on the cross for your sins and was resurrected on the third day, and you believe that's the only way we can go to heaven is simply by accepting Christ into our life. And are you prepared to walk in the ways of Christ all your days? Okay. And that includes uh, being faithful to him and his church and, and uh, doing all that you know to do um, in your power. Amen. In Christ's power. Amen. All right. Well, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, Crystal. Baptizing you in the death of Christ. We're raised to walk in the newsness of life. baptizer because he's more comfortable and there's nothing wrong with that but let me tell you a story first so little Hannah uh, several weeks ago in my uh, office area uh, after sharing the gospel she wanted to receive Christ and her and I were both in tears and we could feel the God's spirit moving and, and she uh, she felt his spirit moving and she's a born again believer now she wants to testify that to you today through her baptism that's why she came today amen all right well Hannah 
upon your profession of faith, are you ready to walk in all the ways of Christ all your days? Upon your profession of faith, your mama Crystal is going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptized with Christ in his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. I always love how the Spirit does things we didn't plan on doing, but it is the best way. Amen. Thank you all for coming and celebrating with us this historic occasion for this family. Pray for them as they want to walk things out.
Well, today's a, a day of running, so <laughs> I asked my wife, I sometimes I don't know if I'm supposed to tuck my shirt in or it's supposed to be out. What's this generation prefer? I don't even know. Tuck in, leave it out. I mean, I honestly don't even know. <laughs> Lauren, what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> she don't know. <laughs> I ask, I ask, uh, I ask John Marsh. He goes, you're fine. You're fine. So he said, I'm fine. We're fine, right? He's our chair deacons. He said, I'm fine. I hope no one... Uh, everything's okay, but we've been so rushed today going here and there, uh, and I hope you're okay with that. But we're coming to worship God, right? 
and it's not about those things. But I find it fitting that uh, Crystal baptized her daughter. That was unplanned because, you know, the Bible tells us that when we are disciples, we're to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. She just baptized her first disciple, her own daughter. <laughs> she did exactly that. And so <laughs> she just baptized her first person. That's what we're to go out and do, folks, just what Crystal is, is, is uh, doing by example and show there. And I pray we become a church of going out um, outside these four walls and meeting people that need to be loved on and to share this great message of salvation that God loves them. He loves them no matter what they've done and that they can receive him. Just as simple as that. It's not a hard thing to do. It's an easy thing actually to do. And so um, what, a, what a great service you had um, so far already today. And thank you for um, sharing about Annie Armstrong, um, Lydia. And uh, we're going to go ahead and, and dive in uh, into this uh, message. But last week we uh, started uh, this two-part sermon series on lasting and loving uh, and fulfilling relationships, how to have them. Um, with the primary target being with the husband and wife, loving each other. But these principles I'm going to share with you, these keys, um, they don't, they're not relegated just to the married couple. They can be extracted, and they are to be extracted, for the church body to um, embody these traits toward one another. And so when I share this, don't think that, oh, this is message not for me, that's for married folks, you know. Uh, I'm not married anymore because uh, either I'm a widow or a widower or I'm a teenager. No, these are, this is a message for you too because... You need to know that um, all of us are planning a wedding, the greatest wedding that mankind has ever known, and that is the wedding that's going to take place in the future, very near, I believe, and that's the wedding between Christ and his bride, the church, you and I, of Jesus Christ. So amen, okay? God wants to marry us. Believe it or not, spots and all here, uh, but blemish totally over there how he sees us now. But our primary aim here is to give you some keys, uh, some life-changing keys that we are responsible for as people of God, as husband and wife, as church members, in order that we can have more satisfying relationships um, with each other. And so um, we're going to go ahead and, and dive in. And by the way, this is important that we understand that when we emulate these traits that Christ has given us, we are putting on display Christ. We are, putting, we are, the, we are privileged by the power of the Holy Spirit to actually showcase Christ, what Christ looks like in our relationships with one another. And so we need to know that. Um, so before we get in, um, and, and warning... In order to lay a foundation here, we're going to lay a, a principle, a verse, right out the gate, right out the gate here, that a lot of people in American culture don't like. Now, and the word is submit. So on your outline there, I put an outline in your bulletin. Uh, there's a, a word coming up. I'm going to give you a warning, warning, warning. Uh, there's a word called submit, and we don't like that as Americans for different reasons, okay? But it's biblical, so I just preach the Bible. If you're upset or offended, I, I, I mean, I don't know what to say, but it's between you and God. So we're going to dive right in. Ephesians 5, 22, 24, it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you would to the Lord. Now, as to the church submits to Christ, that's for church members there. As the church submits to Christ, also, also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, in everything, that sounds a little unreasonable if you say that your husband says, Honey, it's snowing outside. And my favorite football game is on, and so I want you to go in the 30 degree below zero temperature, um, and I want you to snow, snow shovel the driveway in 30 degree below zero uh, temperatures, and I want you to do uh, the other 30 neighbors' driveways too. Th is that what everything means? No, it does not mean that. And I'm not in danger by saying that. It certainly does not mean that. That's unreasonable, especially if she couldn't do that physically, especially if she's ailing um, and bad health herself. So... Um, but we need to understand that this concept of authority, or we're all um, in this economy that God's created, where that's just a hierarchy that God has created, that that's just the umbrella in which it works best. It's, it's harmonious when we operate under the principle and economy of authority. And so um, and it's no different in a marital relationship because you could have an impasse where, you know, somebody says, well, hey, our cars broke down, right? And, uh, um, you know, you got one car left, and so... The, the picture of beautiful submission looks like this. It would be like the husband saying, um, Honey, hey, uh, your, the car that usually drives broke down, but I'm willing to drive you to work and then go to my job and then come back and pick you up later. Right? He gives her the offer. He gives her, you know, hey, what would you rather do? Would you rather or drive me to work and then um, you go drive yourself to work and then come pick me up? That kind of thing. You see, 
he's giving her the opportunity to, to choose, and she, you know, and then, uh, uh, th- but somebody has to decide, and so the husband, uh, a lot of times he can, by deference, say, hey, I'm going to give you uh, some options, and then but ultimately we have to uh, choose to go one way. So we have to have this hierarchy set up in, uh, when it comes to submission, because it has to do with order. God is a God of order, and we know that um, in order for order to work, for harmony to be in place, we have to be submissive. If you're to get along with your boss at work, you have to be submissive. If he asks you to take a broom and sweep or take the garbage out, um, you can't have a bunch of employees saying, no, you do that, right? It doesn't work that way. But within reason, because a husband can say, well, my wife should bow down and cater to my every need. She should do everything I say, right? Uh, no, because we have a problem there. Uh, for example, you know, if the wife invokes, it says everything. I mean, if the husband says, it says everything, it doesn't mean everything in the sense um, all-inclusive, no exceptions. I can prove that to you. You say, well, pastor, it says everything. I know, but it also says other things that could be in violation. For example, if a husband is unreasonable or warped or out of his mind, um, he could say, you know what, honey, we're going to have an open relationship. We're going to engage in this swinging lifestyle that I've been reading about, right? Because if she was to give in to that, then she would be violating the scriptures that talk about sexual morality. You see how you can pose problems there. And so I say that to say we have to be reasonable in our application of the Bible. And I think we need more pastors that don't just say black and white. You know, it's, it's all of it, right? No, there's um, scripture clearly gives a principle, but there are um, exceptions when it comes to being unreasonable. Does that make sense? You all hanging with me? Now listen, despite the negative connotations that um, have bled over into the church when it comes to submission, because let's be honest, a lot of men have abused authority um, by being abusive or neglectful, and leaders have been like that, and so it can have negative connotations attached to it because they've misused their authority. Um, it can also, we know in American culture, because of our independence, our strive for it, um, we promote independence. We think that that's something that we don't have to uh, be involved in our marriage relationship when it comes to submission, but it says, um, the Bible still says that the, the husband has been given this position of respectful authority, but not to abuse it. In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, it says, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. So he has to come under Christ first before he even makes these, um, um, you know, these um, line of directions that he wants the family to go in. He should be under his, the Spirit's power and a direction you know, when he leads his home. That's the um, assumption here. And, so, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And so we need the church to return to a healthy definition, understanding of what submission is if we're to return our country back to healthy marriage relationships. Amen? Um, but in, you know, in addition to abuse of authority and independence that the American um, spirit sometimes is built on, uh, it contributes toward this distaste of, for this concept of wives submit to your husbands. We inherently, uh, we're just inherently rebellious, too. Let's just be honest. Um, and we want independent sovereignty over from anyone's rule, including God's at times. And this is what makes us uncomfortable with the word submission, or to be in subjection to, or to be subordinate to. It's what makes us squirm, right? Um, or murmur, you know, or complaining about, you know, when somebody gives us direction or, or likes to go a certain way. Lutheran reformer Philip M. wrote, We neither obey the law nor can obey it before we have been reconciled to God, justified and then reborn. Left to his own devices, sinful man will always be lawless. This disregard for God's law explains his need for a savior. Denise Cooper, um, a woman author of uh, Crosswalk, a website called Crosswalk, in her article entitled The Meaning of Submission in the Bible, says, you know, submit means to yield to the will of another person or authority figure. And to the degree we can subject ourselves to authority figures reflects the extent that we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Because Christians possess a renewed mind and conscience which guides them to obey. And when they don't obey the Holy Spirit, he pricks the conscience and prompts them to repent. Repentance brings awareness of our need to submit. Christian submission is not an act of human will. It's divine work. We can submit to God's authorities and his will only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.21 says, We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So that's our whole reason for wanting to submit is our reverence for Christ. Our reverence for Christ. Do you revere Christ? Do you have great respect for him and want people to be turned on to God through our humility? And by the way, I started with our Sunday school class that the uh, root word for uh, humility, uh, the etymological uh, word is hummus. Did you know that? 
I didn't know that till this morning. Hummus, and I find it interesting. Hummus, it means I'm of the earth, um, or uh, I think down to earth. It means to be a down to earth person, not being more than we're meant to be, but have a proper view of ourselves. And hummus, by the way, uh, I think it's interesting because um, if you really want to be humble, go eat hummus, right? <laughs> if you don't like hummus, think about it. If you don't like hummus and you force yourself to eat it, you have to subject yourself to something you don't like to do. But it's not unreasonable, right? It's not going to kill you. But that's what we feel like sometimes when somebody asks us to do something. It's kind of like eating hummus, right? You ever feel that way when it comes to coming under somebody? It's like, it's like eating hummus that I don't like. Now, if you like hummus, it's not a problem. Sometimes we can go that direction. But have that in your mind clearly, okay? We're called to church, okay, uh, to eat hummus if we're to be humble. I'm saying like, hummus in the sense of humility, okay? We have to revere Christ, revere Christ. It, that's got to be our whole motivation this morning before we do anything. And understand when we do it, we're revering Christ. The next time you have our challenge to submit, ask yourself if you want to revere Christ. That's when it, it tests the metal to the pedal, right? That's the litmus test. Will you revere, revere Christ in that moment, in that nanosecond? So what keys does the wife hold after we set this foundation in place of being submissive as a church to Christ and to one another? What keys does the wife hold or bring to the table in making a marriage more fulfilling and satisfying? Last week we talked about the men. We made ladies go first by working on the men first. And we, we're, we gave a lot more traits to the men, folks, uh, than we're going to give to the women, okay? Because men have a lot more work to be done on them, right? All right, no amens. All right, well, so... Um, so a wife, here's the, here's the first key. I'm just going to share four, uh, four keys here, life-changing keys, four keys. Here's the first. A wife should not stay bitter or resentful toward her husband. A wife should not stay bitter or resentful toward her husband. Listen, if you are going to stay married for more than 30 years, there's going to be a point in time which you're probably going to get bitter. You're going to hold a grudge or get resentful or, or um, not want to talk to him for a couple of days. Um, I, there's probably few women that have ever been able to be perfect through their entire marriage and never be angry with their husband, never be upset or resentful. Uh, that's just rare in the minority. Any, any wife here want to admit that you've never, ever been upset with your husband or angry or, or bitter? Anybody here ever? Okay, well, see, right there, see? So you just proved my, my, uh, my theory there. So we're just going to admit we've all been there, right? I've been there, okay? I'm human. I, I'm imperfect. Um, scriptures say, though, Ephesians 4.31 says, get rid of all bitterness. That assumes that it's there. Now we got to get rid of it. It's there. Now we got to get rid of it. Right? That's the real test. How do you get rid of it? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, and harsh words. It says right there, Ephesians 4.31. Hebrews 12.15 follows. says, see to it that none of you fall short of the grace of God from experiencing it by allowing a root of bitterness to grow up in your heart and cause you trouble. Now, before we get in danger, again, of being trite here when it comes to bitterness, let it be said that getting rid of some bitterness is not easy. I'll just go ahead and say that. It's not. It's not easy. It's not easy. And, and depending on the offense, getting rid of bitterness uh, can be very excruciating, very difficult, and sometimes can take years. In fact, uh, how many of you have heard of the uh, famous Christian author Lisa Turkhurst? T-E-R-K-E-U-R-S-T, Turkhurst. Um, she's written many books, um, a renowned Christian author and speaker, and she knows firsthand how difficult it is not to remain bitter, especially at her spouse after he cheated on her after 25 years of marriage. And she tried to work it out, but he kept cheating on even after um, it was disclosed. They went to counseling uh, and tried everything. But she, uh, in her book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget, her book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget, here she writes, this is very profound, I found it so profound I had to share this with you this morning. Because I wonder if you, if you find yourself there today. I find myself stuck in feeling like some of the unchangeable things in my life were unforgivable. Unchangeable can feel so unforgivable because someone's done something in your life and they can't fix it. They can't make it go back to the way it was. And that unchangeable nature can feel so unforgivable because even... The, if the person was willing to make it right, they can't make it right. And that hopelessness can really lead you to some deep, dark places. This book is for those who are struggling with unresolved pain and can't see a way forward. To some extent, we think that resentment or that residual anger in some weird way protects us from getting hurt again. But it's not real protection. It's like fake protection because eventually it turns us into something we don't want to be. It brings out the worst of us. 
an unhealed version of us. When an untended hurt sits in the human heart too long, it has such a tendency to turn into versions of hate. It's so important that we give people this understanding that you don't have to be stuck in your pain. And she goes on and says, you know what? She said, I, I, I have to get to a place where I actually deserve to be released from this pain by forgiving that person. I deserve to have that life since I have Christ in me. Listen, it wasn't until she acknowledged that pain that she was able to journey, um, begin that journey of forgiveness that was life-changing and empowering. Listen, here's the good news, folks. Wherever you're at, uh, God can help anyone turn resentment into respect. God can help anyone turn resentment into respect. It takes a long time to get there, but it's not saying that other person's actions are respectable or they even respect those actions. It's seeing them as God sees them, getting caught back up to where God has always seen them. And that is that they're a sacred person because they've been created by a sacred God. So their life is sacred. It's valuable. To respect somebody simply says, it simply means to respect that God's made them and they're created in the image of God. So as long as somebody bears the image of God, we have to respect that he's created by them and to respect his property. They're of God. They're sacred. And we have to see them as sacred. Somehow we have to redefine them, not through the lens of just their sins and sinfulness, but through the lens that they also have good things and good things, right? But they're deserving of unconditional love but out of respect for Christ and reverence for him. We do it for him. Listen, God can help any church member here that's bitter or resentful towards another church member. That's the principle here I want us to extract and to apply and to, to ask ourselves, is there anybody I'm bitter currently with another church member or someone out there in the world that I'm not showcasing Christ and what he's like? Because the degree that we forgive is the degree that we show others what Christ is like. Does that make sense? We can't do it without his power, though, folks. We can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, but God's calling us to get rid of bitterness to become better. Get rid of bitterness to become better. Here's a second trait to emulate. A second trait to emulate is a wife is to treat her husband with dignity. Be respectful. It kind of leads into this, right? So in order to do that, we have to get rid of bitterness to be, become more respectful and treat him with dignity. Scripture says, first. Peter 3, 1 through 2 says, Likewise, wives, be respectful and pure in your conduct. That's hard to do, right? When somebody's hurt you. Be pure in your conduct and submissive. There's that word submissive again. Submissive towards your husbands, even if. That's the most powerful, difficult phrase on planet Earth. Two words, even if. Even if they do not obey the word. Or even if they're not saved. Even if they're not living in a conduct that's pure, we are too. We're to set the example then. To show them what it's like. And then hopefully, like, a, a, you know, like dominoes, things will become falling into place once they see us. And they're broken, and they want to be like us, like Christ. So that they may be won over to Christ. That's the power of unconditional love, folks. When we put on pure conduct, even if they don't. When we forgive, right? Without a word, without a word by the conduct of their wives. It reminds me of St. Francis of Assisi, right? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. We can actually win people to Christ without one word. That's what that's saying here. That's where Francis of Assisi probably got that from. Listen, to define dignity, dignity means to treat someone, what dignity means to treat someone with respect, to value them. It means to agree that God values them. They're valued by God. It means to treat them with courtesy and kindness. Um, it means to respect their wishes and decisions, even if you disagree with them. Right? Now again, when I say we are to respect someone's wishes, I'm not talking about respecting any immoral decisions it's just respecting that god's given them free will i don't agree with it but they have free will they're creating god's image they're sacred they're valuable that's it okay so we'll move along listen a book by dr emerson egger writes called love and respect the love she most desires the respect he desperately needs simply points out the two greatest needs of both husband and wife she wants to be loved he wants to be respected and husbands and wives are to meet the needs of their spouse right if you know what they are then we're to meet them what a shame and tragedy and travesty it is if we know what the needs are of the spouse. They've expressed them. They've communicated. They've done their part because they're responsible to. And by the way, don't assume that the other person knows what your needs are. Sometimes we operate that way and they don't. And that's not fair. Right? We don't, can't think of things, some mystical uh, thing like, well, you know, uh, my husband, if he was truly romantic and truly into my vibe and truly into me, he would just know how to flow with everything that goes with me. He should just know. No, it doesn't work that way. He doesn't know. Men are clueless. Men, 
Say, I'm clueless. Tell your wife, right, tell your husband right now. I'm, 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 I don't even know where I'm going with this. <laughs> husbands, husbands, tell your wife right now I'm clueless, right? I need help. Husbands need help. They need to be communicated to, all right? So we have to do that. But then, then the ball is on your court, though. Once they express that need, then you're responsible to meet that. Within reason, though. Okay, we have some caveats we're going to talk about here, so hang tight, because there are some. Um, but did you know the main destroyer, one of the main destroyers of a marriage is it begins with a lack of respect. Men want to be respected. They do. Okay? That's why, you know, men get a lot of fights, you know, on the football field. They feel disrespected by the other guy, right? He, right? That's why they have taunting, uh, a flag now for taunting, all right? Because they know it's, it's going to be an all-out brouhaha. Both teams are going to all come out and fight because one man disrespects another man, right? All right, so, you know, you stamp on the logo in the middle of the field. People don't like that, Right? So we counter that with gentle spirit and respectful thoughts. Listen, I'll give an example here real quickly of a, a woman that I think of that demonstrated uh, respect despite disrespectful conduct. A lot of you know that I shared my uh, biography about my stepfather was very mean and cruel. Um, my mother had to endure watching um, him smack her and belittle me, you know, and uh, there was a lot of abuse. And one time we were even going to Kmart, and I was about six or seven, and he knew that my mom um, wanted me to be in baseball, and I wanted to play baseball, and, and so she was kind of agging him on a little bit to buy a baseball glove. And so when he bought it, he, after he bought it, he took it, and he slammed it into my stomach. And he said, boy, don't you ask for anything else. And so she had to watch this treatment, right, of an abusive man to her and me. But despite that, despite that, she exhibited a gentle, dove-like spirit, a pure conduct despite that. Now, don't get me wrong, she challenged him sometimes, and it probably took a lot for her to challenge him when he was mean like that, because she would confront him, but in a, in a very respectful, calm, and um, as difficult as it must have been, loving way. We, she never won him over to the Lord, but she did what she was supposed to do, and she'll be rewarded for that in heaven one day, and then he'll be challenged with God's authority, why didn't you respond, All right? So he'll be held accountable for that. There's a third trait, and it's related to the second trait. There's a third trait. A wife is to put off complaining toward her husband. A wife is to put off complaining toward her husband. Scripture says, Philippians 2.14, Do everything without complaining and arguing. That's all genders here, by the way. Applies to church leaders, right, to one another. Uh, you know, if you've got a complaint with me after the service, it says right here, don't complain to the pastor. <laughs> it says, do everything, right? Do everything without complaining. No caveats on that one. All right, listen. When you complain, I've got to think, why would God say, you know, we're not to complain? Why? It says in Proverbs 25, 24, better to live on the corner of the roof or alone in an attic than to share a house with a quarrelsome or nagging wife. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 27, 15 says a, a nagging wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. You know, I got to thinking, wonder why God puts that. What, is, what does complaining do? What does that do? It puts on these negative uh, ions into the atmosphere, and it just kind of just closes down a person's spirit, makes them oppressed, and just kind of makes them feel kind of less than and junky. And, and that's why it's, it's contributory to the demise of relationships. So instead of, um, instead of complain, instead of complain, we're to, um, we're to commend. We're to commend. Find something instead of complain. Find something that's commendable about that person, some attribute or trait they, they do have, not what they don't. Things they have done, what they have not done. Start with the positives first. Start with the things they have done first. Start there. Always start with the positive and the things they have done. So we're to put off harsh words uh, towards um, our spouses. You know, no moaning, nagging, whining, groaning. Um, you know, because Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You see that? Right there, easy, easy math. And so we won't go into detail on all the forms of harsh language, you know, being cruelly sarcastic, um, you know, or cutting somebody down, uh, belittling, being overly critical, uh, having a negative spirit, cynical, judgmental, or public ri ridicule your husband. We don't want to do those things. Uh, and that applies to non-married too. Again, folks, we don't want to be uh, gossiping or being cruel behind the scenes um, in front of or with them. So here's the final, ninth rule, a ninth I mean, not ninth. This is number four. Where are we at? Number three or four. Where'd you all want to go with? Uh, anyway, it's the last point. Here's the last point. So this was a little difficult for somebody to hang on. So hang on here, folks. Uh, but um, it's to, the wife is to provide physical affection or intimacy to the husband. And of course, you're saying, of course, you're saying that you're a pastor, you're a man. You're going to say that. 
Uh, now I'm just reading scripture. It's one that if you read his needs, her needs, Willard Harley points out, uh, historically, research shows the top five needs of a man, number one, always bears out physical affection or physical touch. And for the woman, it's usually quality time, right? That's just the way it bears out. Does that mean it's everybody under that categorically? No. No, it's just, a, it's just data shows, research shows. In fact, Scripture says, I think that's why Scripture already knows the way we're designed and biologically built, right? 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says this, Do not deprive each other of physical intimacy unless you both agree to refrain from it for a time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. So if you want to get closer to God, you're going to be absent from that because you're going to draw into the Lord together, then go through a season, that's okay then. But then come together. It doesn't say, after that, since you're so used to it, and you develop the habit, then, you know, don't ever do it again, right? No, it doesn't say that. It says, come together so that Satan will not tempt one of you to what? Well, to have, it's kind of implied, to have intimate relations with someone else or outside the marriage or engage in some other form of illicit sexual activity, like turn to pornography or some other sexual outlet, because their temptation raises through the roof. Now, ultimately, sin is always the fault of the sinner. Okay, don't get me wrong. This is simply saying... If you want to foster, though, an increase of craving and tendency and temptation, then, then, then do these things that the Scripture uh, says um, that um, we're to do or don't do. It says, so, or Satan could also tempt you to become bitter at your spouse or rejecting you, you know, perceived rejection and bitterness. It can grow that grow through years of resentment. Now, before we go, I want to give a couple caveats. Because, again, men have a tendency to abuse uh, and overuse and over-spiritualize and, and, and mishandle uh, scripture. So I want to give a couple caveats. And women, I hope you appreciate this. But if a wife is unable to engage in physical intimacy due to several reasons, like sickness or dying. I have a very good friend whose wife was dying of cancer for um, over a decade. And she was, it was impossible for her to engage in physical intimacy. But he didn't become resentful or angry. He understood. And, and he was okay. She, she couldn't. It would be cruel. He even said it would be cruel to expect my wife to be physically intimate during that time. Here's another reason. There's another caveat um, that would be understandable why a wife could not cater um, to this um, role or this um, fulfillment of this, uh, this need. If the husband has just hurt his wife, if the husband has just hurt his wife with cutting words or has neglected her, or abused her, it's very difficult emotionally to just turn yourself on like a light switch on and off. Admit it, not understanding. The Bible also says to live with your wife with understanding. So you've got a violation going on right there already. We're to live with, them with understanding that you can't expect them to be emotionally into you if you've turned them off because you've mistreated them and been cruel and rude and mean-spirited um, and, all, and all those things. Especially, especially if it's been discovered that he's in the middle of an affair, like Lisa Turkhurst said. That's very difficult, you know, depending on when it's been disclosed and you know, women are not robots. They're not emotional light switches uh, that are, should be expected to just turn on and off. It takes time to process pain. It would be unreasonable and cruel to expect someone who's been so deeply hurt in pain to be intimate. That's all I want to say on that. However, if the wife is able, we're, we all have guilty tendencies, right? To get lazy, right? Uh, different things. And uh, there's times that um, husbands just need to put the remote down and not watch TV and say, you know what, honey, let's go on a date. I don't feel like it. You know, I don't want to stay home. But you know what? I have been gone all week. Let's go out and let's go to a uh, Mexican restaurant. See, sometimes you don't feel like that, but you've got to give in, make a sacrifice, go against the flesh, and give in to the spirit um, to be a good husband and wife's the same, whatever God's asking us to do that we're struggling at times, right? To go the extra mile. But listen, the bottom line is most men didn't get married to enter the monastery or lifelong monkhood. That needs to be said because 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9 says, To the unmarried and the widows, I say this, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. I'm not saying burn in hell. It's talking about burning in passion. Basically, the idea is that men, because of their biology, right, that one of the God-ordained purposes of marriage is you get married to come together intimately because they have those desires. Let's be honest. It's, it doesn't go away if God's given it to them, and we have to understand that. And to, be, to burn means to be tormented to be tormented by to the point where um, you become bottled up and um, frustrated and it can lead to bitterness and resentment and then you have um, a fear dance going on between the two um, so anyway listen I come to a close to saying this when the spouse 
loves the other spouse in the way that God prescribes, you are directly saying God's character is worth being put on display. And when it comes difficult, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to give you power to do things you don't like to do. Corey Tim Boom said that when she met and confronted uh, the murder of her sister from the Nazi concentration camp at a church, after she preached the gospel, the soldier that killed her sister came up to her and said, will you forgive me? I've been convicted. I've asked Christ to be my savior. Will you forgive me? He put his hand out. She did not want to shake his hand. Everything in her says, no, I, I can't do this. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came upon her, and he enabled her to do something despite her deepest wishes. And she shook his hand. They reconciled. It was forgiven. And bitterness was gone. Even somebody that's murdered your own family member. That's only through the love of God and the power of God, folks. That's only the well in which we've got to draw from to do able to do some of this stuff, to love each other well. But when a husband loves her, when a wife loves her husband well, she's loving God well. Know that. When you're loving your husband well, you're loving God well. It's directly a correlation there. And when a woman chooses not to be bitter, she reflects that God is not bitter towards us. The husband gets to experience God through her, through his forgiveness. And when a, um, a church member chooses to not stay bitter, we're reflecting God's goodness and his grace. And we all get to experience a more lifelong, um, satisfying, enriching, and fulfilling, and lasting relationship that we otherwise could not. And if you embody these traits, or these roles I just displayed, there's only four there for you women there this morning. Men, I gave you, I think, um, over 100 last week. But um, listen, when you nail down these traits, you're putting a slam dunk. The scores are going to be made perfect. The judges are going to go crazy, right? And say, so you, just, you just scored a top score. You win the slam dunk competition. You get the prizes in heaven. I'm going to show you this uh, guy is only 6'2", just won the NBA slam dunk competition. He's, uh, this is just a, a visual for you as we go, because we want to put a slam dunk um, on the way we treat each other and, and get the winning card, the winning score. Here it is, folks. This is what I'm going to close with. I'm not saying it's a no. You refereeing the name on the back of the jersey. Oh, well, I got to say that slow motion. I'm not refereeing the basketball. Man. If you hit the glass, Come on, there Kenny. Did you see that? Play one more time, John. God wants you to be able to leap and do things you never imagined you could do. In your relationship. They know. I'm not saying it's they a know. You referee in the name on the back of the jersey. Oh, well, I got to see it in slow motion. I'm not referee in the basketball. Man. If you hit the glass. Come on. There, Kenny. there we go, folks. Looking. Let's put a slam dunk on embodying these traits and fulfilling the roles that God's give us this week. You can. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you can leap greater and do things you never imagined you could do. Okay? To win for God. To run well. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. Um, we thank you, your spirit's here. And if there's anybody here that has never accepted Christ as their Savior, they can do so here in the next few seconds. I find it amazing that we're going to all spend somewhere in eternity that's a long time, and how it only takes three or four seconds to give our heart and life to Christ. By simply saying, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to heaven, but I want to go. And if that's all it takes is accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, to be forgiven, have an intimate personal relationship with Him, and go to heaven forever. That's something I want. Let's put a slam dunk on that decision today, Father. I pray however people are here, Father, if there's someone here that's never been baptized, don't have a church home, or looking for a church home, uh, they're, they're, they're depressed or sad because uh, of an issue in their life or a family member um, that's afflicted with something that's uh, critical, we pray, Father, we come now and just pray. However you lead, Holy Spirit, may we come forward and and give you the decisions that we need to make because your word deserves a response. How will we respond today? Is our marriage the way it's supposed to look like? Are we in relationships the way it's supposed to look like? Father, we know that revival can break out when people become reconciled and when people open their heart to your spirit. Your spirit can be poured out in great ways. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. broken heart to her. They put on medication to help her stress. We got an update from Allie. They are, and I don't understand this, I'm not a doctor or a they are keeping him sedated and cooled until midnight. Then they will start to gradually raise his body temperature and try to wake him up. They won't know anymore until he is awake. Peggy did not have a heart attack. She has what is known as broken heart syndrome. She has been given new meds and told to relax. <laughs> and this was coming from Peggy. God bless prayers answered. Amen. Amen. All right. They work. It's a Amen. Oh, about it. I
Amen. Amen. Stay back to the last 20 minutes. Okay. I love you, brother. Amen. Well, I don't know what we're going to play, Brother Bob and Ann, but you play what God's had prepared for you to prepare for us. And let's just give our hearts to the Lord, folks. Let's just give our hearts to the Lord in ways we never have. Let's go full throttle. Let's go full bore ahead with the Lord in being the Christians, the Christian witnesses, the evangelicals, the missionaries, all our identities that God's assigned us. Let's go all out. Life is short, right? Life is going by in a blaze. Live life through the lens of eternity. We don't know when we're going to go. It could be tomorrow. Let's live each day like it's our last. You'll love your best when you do that. Let's close the word of prayer. I'm going to ask my dear brother, Wes. Wes, I love you, brother. Your family's been through a lot with COVID, too, recently. And Would you mind closing the word of prayer? Remember God.